Neil, thank you so much for coming to join us on the show today. This is one of those subjects that gets people debating with so much information and hopefully we'll decide whether there's a lot of misinformation out there as well around a subject that applies to every single person on this planet, which is sleep. So I suppose, first of all, so, so that everyone rather than people throwing stuff at their screens going, no, what does he know? Maybe we can, <laughs> maybe you can tell us a little bit about, first of all, your background, but also how on earth you got so passionate about sleep. Uh, the answer to both those questions is by complete and utter accident. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, went to secondary school in the UK, was relatively intelligent, did, did my O levels, um, thought I would go to sixth form and then to university. I was interested in chemistry and, you know, so I went to sixth form as a boy of 16 and absolutely hated it. I thought I was going to be an adult, uh, but I was still being taught like a child and I hated it. So within the first week, I started looking for a job. And the first job I found, the only job that I applied for um, was at the Institute of Aviation Medicine, which is the Royal Air Force Station, that back in 1982 had, uh, you know, the Air Force still had long duration capability. So we were flying to uh, you know, Hong Kong, Singapore, America, places like that. Uh, and that had a sleep lab. Uh, it was a three bed sleep lab. And now, 40 years later, it's all I've ever done is, is, is uh, watch other people fall asleep, which sounds a bit creepy when you say I say it out loud but it isn't meant to be um and and so so my passion it goes back to that sort of Motown song if you can't be with the one you love love the one you're with so uh, <laughs> this is all I know how to do so I've got to be good at it I've got to like it because I'm, I've got no other skills so I've been involved in sleep research as I say for 40 years worked with the Air Force then moved to the University of Surrey where I created the world's largest uh, clinical trial sleep laboratory. So I was uh, watching 24 people a night sleep um, pretty much 365 days a year. I've worked clinically in hospitals around uh, Northern Europe. Uh, and, you know, I've written a book about it. I'm often in the media, um, both UK and internationally as a sleep expert. So uh, pretty, pretty much, you know, I've published with psychologists on uh, job stress uh, and sleep, sociologists with uh, couples sleep, how individuals disturb each other, uh, and basic science and also the effects of medication on sleep. Wow. Okay. So much to go into. Okay. So the stereotypical thing we always hear is you need to have eight hours sleep to have a good night's sleep. However, I've grown up all of my life from the age of 18 years onwards, getting four to five hours sleep a night. My mother's exactly the same. And people say to me, because I'm in the gym very early in the morning, so across my social media, people are like, what on earth possesses you to get up at that time of the day? And I'm like, well, that's the time I naturally wake up. And so I like to get up and go. What are the rules? Are there rules, for goodness sake? Are there rules on sleep? What, what should we do? And what's the old wives' tales? And what's the misinformation and nonsense that exists out there? Well, I mean, the first the first one, it, the, the piece of nonsense is that we all need eight hours. Um, I cannot find where this statement has come from. None of the classic books about sleep right from the 16th century onwards never mention eight hours. Aristotle in his book that he wrote 300 BC didn't mention eight hours. Nobody has mentioned we all need eight hours. It seems to have developed from around the idea of the eight hour working day. Back in 1850, 1860, there was the idea of the eight hour work day. So eight hours work, eight hours leisure, and then eight hours rest. And it was rest. It wasn't sleep. It was rest. And you can, you know, and that's, I think, it's just become a shorthand. But sleep need is individual. And it's a bit like height. You have short people, you have tall people. Um, so you have short sleepers and you have long sleepers. So there are a small proportion of people who are absolutely fine and thrive on four hours sleep. There are other people who have to have 11 hours to thrive. After 40 years as a sleep expert, I know I need nine and a half hours sleep. 
And if I don't get nine and a half hours sleep, I am really not at my best. So the question is not how much sleep as in time you need, but it's a very simple question. How do you feel during the day? If you feel awake, alert, focused, functioning at a high level, then you had enough sleep. Doesn't matter how much you had. If you feel sleepy during the day, you didn't have enough sleep. So you know this. You don't need an app or a watch or a tracker to tell you this. You know whether you feel good or not. And if you don't, and if you feel sleepy, then you probably didn't get enough sleep. So it's finding out what's right for you and then making sure you get that sleep. So as a nine and a half hour a night person, I need to be in bed for at least nine and a half hours. If I'm only in bed for eight hours, I will never get nine and a half hours sleep. Uh, and, and the best thing, the absolute ideal thing would be for you to go to bed when you feel sleepy, whatever time that is, Sleep for as much as you want or as much as you need and then wake up naturally. And when you wake up naturally, get up. You know, so many people press the snooze button or they look at the clock and think, like you said about going to the gym early. Oh, you know, it's it's six o'clock and I wanted to wake up at seven o'clock. And so I failed somehow. Well, you haven't. If you are awake, you've got an hour more. Don't think, oh, I failed and isn't it terrible and oh, woe is me and I'll, you know, I'll, maybe I'll turn over and I'll close my eyes and I may get a few more minutes of sleep. You may not. So why not just get up? So, you know, so you're, if you give your body the opportunity to get the sleep it needs, it will get the sleep it needs. It's, it's as simple as that. And so as I say, so many people look at this eight hours and judge themselves against it. Oh, I didn't get eight hours sleep, therefore I have a sleep problem. Not asking themselves, well, actually, am I feeling okay? You know, if you feel good, don't worry about it. And this is it. I say I've, I've spent 40 years looking at sleep, watching people fall asleep. Behind me, you will see the 400 sleep books that I bought just in lockdown. I have a library of over 2,500 sleep books. Wow. It's my passion. But I know that the only question really worth you know the whole thing about sleep can be summed up by the question how do you feel during the day if you feel good don't care i really don't care if you feel good don't change a thing if you feel sleepy then maybe look at your sleep okay let's go into uh, understanding different type of sleep because there's many people i mean let's just roll back this i want to show my age here television used to end at midnight when i was young and then I think Channel 4 extended it by a few hours and uh, when that yeah. came out. So I'm 51 years old, so I remember all of this. And we kind of like, we, we could stay up longer if we wanted to. And then obviously then the mobile phone came in and that, that completely destroyed everything because people stare at their devices, etc. which I'll come on to in a second. Let's say you fall asleep on the sofa of an evening and, and my parents religiously do this. If I go to their house, they live in Cyprus, I go to their house, whatever is on telly about nine o'clock, both of them heads tilted back, mouths wide open, me making videos, laughing at my parents both being asleep on the sofa. What kind of quality of sleep is the falling asleep in front of the telly type of sleep by comparison to actually being in bed under your duvet on your pillow? The thing is, sleep is sleep, essentially. Uh, and and, and f we have two states of being during the night, but four stages of sleep. So stage one is the transition from awake to asleep. So if you are awake and you're going to go to fall, uh, fall asleep, you go through stage one sleep. So it's a very light stage of sleep. And if I were to wake you up in stage one sleep, you'd say, oh, why did you do that? I wasn't actually asleep. But it's the sleep that you have when you're at your desk and your head sort of drops or, or when you're driving along and you can't remember the last five miles. And that's because you've fallen asleep in stage one. So that makes up about one to five percent of the night. Then we go into stage two sleep, which makes up about 50 percent of the night. And although it makes up about 50 percent of the night, we've no idea what it does, uh, really, which is a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a problem. Um, and then you will move into the deep sleep, the N3 sleep. And this is the deep restorative sleep. So usually of an evening when we go to bed, it will take us about 20 minutes to get into that deep 
restorative sleep. And we'll have a period of that for about 70 to 90 minutes. And then we'll have our dreaming periods. And these happen every 90 minutes through the night. Now, if you fall asleep on the couch, this happens. Whenever you fall asleep, this pattern follows the same pattern. The problem is, is that falling asleep on the couch, you then wake up. Um, and you may wake up in deep sleep and feel worse than you did <laughs> when you before you fell asleep. And then what will happen is that you'll go into the bedroom and suddenly you can't sleep. Because when you're on the couch, you just gave in to nature. But when you go into the bedroom, it's, oh, I'm going to bed. I must fall asleep. I must, you know, there's, there's an expectation of what's going to happen. And the reason people fall asleep in front of the telly is very simple. From an evolutionary point of view, we can only fall asleep when we feel safe and secure and when we've met all of our physical needs. So if we've had food, water, um, you know, made sure we're uh, uh, perpetuating the species, whatever. <laughs> Once we've done that, there's nothing to do. Anything else is a waste of time and energy. So if we feel safe and secure, then we fall asleep. So if you've had a meal and you're sat in front of the telly, it means that there's no threat to your life. You know, we, we now have houses build, built of bricks with front doors that we can lock, with windows that you can shut. We don't have to worry about, you know, tigers or people from the next village attacking us or whatever. And we don't have to worry where the next meal comes from. We don't have to think, oh my, you know, I didn't kill a wildebeest today. How will I survive the night? So none, we, we have no worries. And let's say meeting our physiological needs is very easy. So you're sitting there in front of the TV and the body goes, right, that's it. I'm not doing anything. I'm not, like, you know, I might as well sleep because sleep is good. I might as well do it. Um, and so the advice there is if you feel sleepy, you know, when, you, when your head starts nodding and you start yawning, go to bed. Because there's no point having a couple of hours on the couch, waking up with a cricked neck, with a pain, dribble down your chin, and then going to bed and then not being able to sleep. My, you know, I, this is what I do. If I feel sleepy, I will go to bed. Last night I went out to a concert in London. I didn't get home until half past one, and I woke up at half five. So I've had you know half the sleep I need. So. After I talk to you, I'll have some tea, I'll read a magazine, and I'll probably be in bed by seven o'clock and probably be asleep by half seven. But I'm not going to fight it because I, you know, my body is saying you need to go to sleep. And so if you're on the couch, if you feel sleepy, go up to bed and sleep there. And then you don't have that wakening, which you will inevitably have sleeping on the couch. And then you'll sleep through the night. Interesting. Okay, let, let, let's let's probably look into dreams then as well while we're here because I've I've hardly ever dreamed. You know, people say to me, "What do you dream about?" and I'm like, "No idea." But <laughs> I'll occasionally have a dream and I'll never ever remember what that dream was. However, my wife has dreams all of the time. Will wake up most days and say, "Oh, let me tell you about my dream last night," and she recounts it in great detail. And, 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 you, and again, I'm no expert. So you hear that, that dreaming only takes place in the kind of REM phase of sleep in that deep sleep. Is, is dreaming something that whilst you're in that deep sleep, impacting it negatively? Or is it just a thing that we live with? It's interesting. We don't really understand dreams. Um, it, you, you know, you have the Freudian and the Jungian uh, analysis of dreams and you can go into a bookshop and buy a thousand and one dreams explained. Um, but the issue with that is that if we dream as humans, what does a cow dream about? What does a duck-billed platypus dream about? We know they dream, but what are the, you know, so Freud would say it's a way of, you know, <laughs> protecting your subconscious and that sort of thing. People will say it's a way of wish fulfillment or whatever. What does a cow dream? There's nothing going on in a cow's brain. 
Uh, you know, it's about it's about you know emotions. It's about um, emotional memory, emotional well-being. Is it a sad cow or a happy cow? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if there is a test for this. So whatever, we know that as a very primitive animals, you know, down to the duck bill platypus, dream. We think birds dream. We're pretty uncertain about insects. But dreaming, I mean, Joey Siegel, who has done a lot of work in animals and, and, and looked at sleep and dreams and animals, he describes dreams as like the froth on the top of a pint of beer. It's an epiphenomenon. It's not important. It's just a consequence. Um, Alan Hobson, who's one of the great scientists of dreams, described it as a temporary madness. Um, the, you know, we lose control of our conscious control. And so essentially when we dream, we are mad. Do dreams mean anything? Well, that's down to you. I've got a good friend, professor of sociology, and he will tell you, he will bore you, about how Star Wars is an incredibly philosophical movie and there's a deep philosophical meaning to it. I just see it's men in plastic suits faffing about. <laughs> you know, so that, you know, so there is a difference. So the thing is, you only dream during your REM sleep. And we have about five periods of REM sleep a night, which means we will probably uh, have five dreams a night. But you can only remember a dream if you wake up during it. So because you said earlier that you have a short period of sleep, you're not going to have as much REM. You're not going to wake up frequently through the night because your sleep will be consolidated. Therefore, you will not experience dreams. Whereas your wife may be waking up more frequently, and then she will tell you the story of the dream. However, the dream she is telling you is not the dream she had. What? Because dreams are not logical. You know when you go to the cinema, and before the feature, you have the, um, the trailers? Yes. Um, and you know, Six minutes, and if there's a joke in it, and it's an American movie, you know that's the only joke, so you don't have to see the movie. Uh, <laughs> but there's enough, there's enough stuff happening in that trailer for you to construct a story. Whether it's the, what the actual film is, you can construct, well, I, you know, oh, it's a cop movie, it's a buddy movie, they get hijacked by the bad people, they win, that's it. So Alan Hobson, who I mentioned earlier, he kept a dream diary for 30 years. So he wrote down his dreams and he also wrote down events that occurred that may have influenced our dreams. So he reckons that we remember about 25% of a third of our dreams. So not a lot. So what your wife is doing is taking the madness of the dream which if she said out loud you'd be going you're a bit mad <laughs> let's take you to the psychiatrist <laughs> and she's making sense of it she's telling her story so she doesn't appear mad and and so she's only talking about a little bit of what's happened and then as i say she's putting her gloss which is why people only tell you about their interesting dreams you know, if somebody told, if somebody said, oh, I must tell you about my dream. I, I, I went shopping to the supermarket and I bought a loaf of bread. You'd go, you're the dullest human being on earth. <laughs> this is your fantasy life and all you're thinking about is buying bread. Um, and so when people go to a psychiatrist, they, they always tell them the extreme, the frightening, the scary, the erotic. Um, whereas most of your dreams are utterly, utterly dull. So your wife won't be telling you about those because she doesn't want you to think that she's boring, but she won't tell you what really happened because you'll think she's mad. Wow. Okay, that's interesting. Talk to me, talk to me about the correlation between stress and sleep. Uh, some people kind of 
some people kind of it's almost like they live with the world's problems on their shoulders um regardless of of whether the stress is real it's obviously very real for them and other people kind of that they, they manage stress in a much easier way but what impacts does a stressful environment you know they say traditionally that, that the men will stress more about money than women and women will stress more about family and stuff like that so some stereotypical examples but how how much impact does it have well, stress is, stress is interesting because a certain degree of stress is good. Um, you know, having a deadline to me, not in, a, in a, an imposed thing, but, you know, I, I, I write a lot. And if I don't have a deadline, I just don't do it. But if you have a deadline, then suddenly you're sparky and you, you know. And stress is also uh, the thing that means you don't leave the aircraft the, the, your flight tickets on the piano or you you remember to switch the oven off that's stress but the problem with stress is that it is a it it is it, the fight or flight response so stress means you either hit it or you run away from it that's the basic um you know evolutionary thing now, that is good during the day. Your senses have to be heightened. You have to be aware of everything because that's going to save your life. But as I mentioned earlier, we now have houses. We, we are not now threatened by you know, exter you know, external factors. We don't have to worry about, as I say, being attacked or being robbed or dying of some hideous disease. We, you know, we don't have really external threat but we do have that external threat which is stress whatever you are stressed or worried about is a threat and so your body is in that fight or flight response and that's exactly the opposite of what you need to have when you go to bed you, you know you, going to bed you need a quiet mind and a relaxed body stress is the complete opposite. You're worrying about whatever it is that you're worried about, and your body is ready to either engage in combat or to run away. And, you know, the, the thing about stress and sleep is that sleep is the best solution for stress, but stress is, you know, probably for many people that major component that is stopping them from actually getting to sleep so you know practicing stress reduction techniques but also ensuring that you make that time for sleep and you try to get a good night's sleep is what you can do with that um but it is it is a problem because as i say you know you need a quiet mind to sleep and if you're worried about something you you've lost that quiet mind so having the wind down relaxing doing something before bed that is beneficial um to help you just wind down and far too many people don't do that you know many people's bedtime routine is to switch the tv off go to the bathroom brush their teeth flop into bed expecting sleep to magically happen and then being slightly disappointed when it hasn't uh, and you know you have to in the same way you know you wouldn't just walk in off the street into the gym and just go straight into a high intensity exercise you have to prepare for that well in a way you have to prepare in the opposite way i.e winding down for sleep and when you're stressed and you're working hard and we you know we all know those people who send emails at 11 o'clock at night uh the, the, that sort of macho always on attitude this is not going to help you get a good night's sleep there's lots of activities that come to mind when it comes to getting in the right state before you go to sleep so you can de-stress but um i've been convincing my wife for a number of years now that the most important one to use is not meditation but sex and um she does fight me against it sometimes <laughs> <laughs> again there is actually a good uh, evolutionary theory and it goes back to being safe and secure um, if you look at monkeys and gorillas and lions and that they have sex very very quickly because if you're engaging in sex you're taking the eye off what's happening around you so you're vulnerable um, 
And so humans, and this goes back to the development of the bedroom and the Protestant idea of shame back in uh, the mid-Tudor period, uh, if you are relaxed enough to have pleasurable sex, you are relaxed enough to sleep. In the same way, if you are relaxed enough to have a nice meal, again, you know, if you're, if you're a, a leopard and you take down a, 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 an antelope, you're small. So you need to hide that food. You either to carry it up a tree or you hide it somewhere and then you go back to it because the bigger guys can come and push you off. So you have to be very furtive. So if you've had a nice meal and let's say there's no threat, you could eat your meal in peace, then again, that's why you fall asleep after having had a nice meal. It's nothing to do with the food. It's the body just going, this is nice. I'm not threatened. I can relax. And if I'm going to relax, I'm going to sleep. And all, and all the people you studied over the years, how, how big a part or, or what, what percentage have you learned of people that suffer from chronic insomnia? Well, insomnia is, insomnia is a medical term which has been used to just mean people who have poor sleep. Um, but, but I say there's a proper definition of insomnia, uh, which is about at any one time, about a third of people aren't sleeping well. And about 10% of those, so about sort of 3 to 10% of the population will have chronic insomnia. Um, wow. But the term insomnia doesn't help because it, 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 in a way it, it talks about a medical issue and then people will say, well, you don't actually have insomnia, but I don't sleep well. So the thing is, are you sleeping well or not? Are you satisfied with your sleep? And I say about 30 to 50 percent of people are unsatisfied with their sleep uh, at any one time. Uh, but the definition of insomnia, both in America and in the UK, in their guidelines, means you have to have poor sleep for three months before it's considered chronic insomnia. Um, most people would not wait three months before going to their doctor. You know, if you're really not sleeping well, you're not going to go, oh, I've got another 12 weeks of this before I go and complain. You will probably go earlier than that. And so you should, um, because if you can deal with insomnia the minute you're aware of the problem, then it may not progress to being a, you know, a longer period of insomnia. Um, but one of the issues is that a lot of people just think that poor sleep is part of life mm. you know i work hard i play hard you know what can i expect or i'm getting old you know i have to get up twice a night to pee so you know what what can i expect it's just life and yes sleep does change uh, and yes the things like you know getting up to go to the bathroom repeatedly in the night is a problem but it's a medical problem that can be addressed like snoring or sleep apnea, these where you stop breathing during night, these can be addressed. But many people just think, you know, you know, I've been dealt a dodgy pair, you know, hand of cards. What can I, you know, why bother? So you have to realise that some, you know, aspects of sleep are fixable, others aren't. But and also again mentioning this sort of societal thing, you know, the twenty four seven hour, twenty four seven society. The, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a couple of years older than you, but you know, as you say, TV goes through the night. You know, when I started work back in 1982, the idea that you could take a computer home with you and work after five o'clock would have blown my mind. Um, you know, you worked nine to five, you went home. That was it. Um, and so we, we ha we've constructed this world, the, the fear of missing out. You mentioned phones and screens, the ability to work. You know, I, I commute backwards and forwards uh, quite often to Poland and the flight from Krakow to London is at six o'clock in the morning, which is five o'clock UK time. And you see people in the airport at four o'clock in the morning on their computers working. Why? You know, it's, it's a stupid time to be awake in the first place. 
Why are you working? Or the, the minute they land in London at ten past eight, they're on their mobile phone like they're somehow important. And we've 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 constructed this world where we've well in the past we've always had the ability to avoid sleep. You know, for four hundred thousand years we've had fire, and we would sit around the fire after it had got dark, and we would tell stories and and all that. We've we've had that for a long time. And then people said, well, it was uh, Thomas Edison and his light bulb. No, we've had candles. It wasn't Edison and his light bulb. What changed society is much, much more recent. And it's heating because overnight it gets cold and your body temperature drops. And so having heating and this in the UK with central heating is about 50 years. 50 years. That's it. That's when society could colonize the night. Before that, you made the decision to put the last log on the fire or the last piece of coal on the fire. You made that decision. As you said, TV went off, pubs closed, late night shopping was six o'clock on a Thursday night. Somehow we coped. But now we have that ability. So when we talk about sleep problems, it goes back to what I said earlier about are you giving yourself the chance to sleep? So complaining that you're only getting five hours a night sleep, but you're only in bed for five hours, you don't have a problem. Medically, you need to stay in bed a bit more. Um, but of course, people don't like having to do things. <laughs> they don't want to be told to behave themselves. Um, and it's a bit tr like you know, t t telling people to get a good night's sleep is a bit like telling your three year old child to get a good night's sleep. It, people don't see it, which is bizarre because we're living in a society where we're, you say, you go to the gym. 40 years ago, just, there were no gyms. A gym was somewhere where you, some, you, you know, working class lads went to box. That was what a gym was, and no respectable person would go anywhere near that type of place. Um, but now you've got the gym, so you go to the gym. You may eat healthily, you eat organically, you eat, you know, fresh food. And these are good. You say to somebody, get a good night's sleep, and people go, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, I'll sleep when I'm dead, sleep's for wimps. So, you know, if I said to you, you know, I run five kilometers a day, and I eat my five fruit and veg a day, you'd go, oh, well done, good man. If I say I sleep for nine and a half hours a day, you go, you're a sad git with no friends. <laughs> now, that might be true, but it is just as laudable <laughs> as eating healthily and, and, and exercising. But people don't see that with regards to sleep. They don't make that connection in the same way. Uh, and that that's what is difficult as they after 40 years um, and all the information we have about sleep, people aren't changing their behaviors compared to, you know, not smoking, drinking less, eating healthily, going and get your exercises. All of those have worked. But the getting people to sleep better is a much, much more tougher sale um uh, and as i say after 40 years i'm not absolutely convinced i know how to do it are there any are there any uh, uh, uh any information or any knowledge out there understanding whether any of this is hereditary yeah i mean there is there is a you know there was a study done at the university of surrey about four years ago showing that a bad night's sleep actually affects 927 separate genes. Um, so there are a number of genes, you know, per three, clock, and those sorts of things that are involved in duration of sleep and whether you're a morning or an evening person. So as I say, I need nine and a half hours sleep. I cannot do anything about that. I can't train myself to need less. I can learn how to cope, but I'm also two meters tall. When I go to an airport and I'm in economy, I'd love not to be two meters tall, but standing there going, I'd love to not be two meters tall isn't gonna help. It can't change it. Same with morningness and eveningness. 
uh, that is very much you said, you know, that people um, are individuals, but the genetic makeup. So if your parents were morning people, you are almost certainly going to be a morning person yourself. If your parents are long sleepers, you are almost certainly going to be a longer sleeper. Um, yes, of course, most people are you know, between seven and nine hours, and most people don't have a strong morning-evening preference. Most people just sort of mud you around in the middle. About 20% of people are strong morning people, and about 25% are strong evening people. And I'd say the rest in the middle don't really uh, mind. But yeah, there is a, there's a strong genetic link. Uh, it, you know, in these conditions, or in in the way that in the way that you sleep. When I in it, what was it about two thousand and twelve? So eleven years ago now, I went through a bout of chronic depression, and while I was um, depressed, I had a I had a period of three nights where I didn't sleep a wink for three nights, even though I tried my best to. I even went to the gym three times a day during the course of the day to try and tire myself out, but I couldn't. And so that, that depression, the, the, moment, the moment I laid down to try and sleep in whichever capacity, my mind raced uh, like crazy and there was just no way my eyes would stay closed. For people, and a, lot, a, lot, a lot more people suffer with mental health issues now. I don't know. Mental health is more uh, openly talked about nowadays. So let's not say that, 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 that more people suffer now, but mental health is spoken about more nowadays. The, and so there will be people that suffer in the way that I suffered during that period. Is there, a, is there medication that people should take or is there a, you know, a strict protocol that people should follow to help them get into a place where when they are really challenged, from either depression or, or bouts of extreme anxiety to help them get the rest that they need? The problem with um, depression and sleep well, is depression, pain and sleep, uh, which, you know, pain obviously disturbs sleep, uh, depression, anxiety uh, as well. They, they all arise in the same part of the brain, the limbic system of the brain. So if you have a problem with one, you're probably going to have a problem with the other. So it's collateral damage. So you're depressed. Um, depression can lead to insomnia, but insomnia can lead to depression. So it's a chicken and an egg situation. So just by treating the depression doesn't necessarily mean that your sleep will improve. Oh. Um, and the same... So So... The, the problem is many of the drugs that are used for depression that are commonly used for depression are excellent for depression, but they're not very good for sleep. Ah. Um, they can actually cause sleep problems. So Prozac, which everybody's heard of Prozac, will cause insomnia in about 26% of people who take it. It's an alerting drug. Mm. So... You've got depression, you can't sleep. You take a drug for your depression that makes you not sleep. <laughs> so there are antidepressants that are better for sleep than, than others. Um, but unless when you talk to your doctor, you mention sleep as a problem, they may not compute. They may just think you're depressed, you need um, you know, a drug to stop you being depressed, that's it, sort of thing. So a, a, a psychiatrist called David Healy, 25 years ago, said, you know, that some people who are depressed need a chill pill and some people who are depressed need a kick up the ass pill. So there's different types of depression. So when you're talking about, you know, your mind racing, the last thing you need is a medication that makes you more alert. You need the chill pill. So you need to talk to your doctor about that and you need to get fixed. What is the problem for you? Is your problem depression or is your primary problem your sleep? And you hear people say things, oh, you know, if only I could get a good night's sleep, I could cope. So in that instance, fix the sleep. Mm. Yeah. Um, because that's your problem. But 
you go to a doctor and say, I'm depressed and I can't sleep, the doctor will go, depression, bad, you know, I will treat that. Whereas actually what you want, you would cope much better if you could sleep. So there's no, let's say, there's no one size fits all um, approach to this. And the other thing to say is, that in uh, in the last 15, 20 years, we've moved away from using medication for sleeping problems. Now, if you look at the clinical guidelines, it's something called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which is a talking therapy, uh, which basically addresses the reasons, the behaviors why you're not sleeping and helps you um, develop the tips and techniques to get a better night's sleep. That's been shown to be beneficial, both as a treatment for insomnia, but also in conditions like anxiety or depression. Um, so, so you're you're approaching. So you're treated for the depression, uh, and you're treated with a, a, a say with a psychological treatment, uh, CBTI, for the sleep condition. And hopefully, the combination of those two means that you get a better outcome. Um, so, as I say, the thing is, as I say, it's that individuality. It's, you know, what are you complaining of as an individual and what do you want fixed? And you have to make that plain to your doctor because you don't want your doctor assuming what is important. You need to tell them what for you is important. Good, yeah, good advice there. What's the name of that medication that people used to? Have? Is it mel melanin? What? What is mel melatonin? Melatonin. That's right, melatonin. So people mm. used to, you know, rave about that. Get melatonin. That'll help you go to sleep at night. That's the thing. I remember somebody from my office years ago. Um, I, I don't know where I was, but a package arrived at home, and it was a big bag of these capsules of melatonin. This will help you sleep, Spence. And I was like, oh, thanks for that, pal. You know, I had to go for a week, and it made no difference at all. But um, does does it have an impact? No. Um, <laughs> melatonin, uh, melatonin, there was a book back in 1985 called The Melatonin Miracle. You've, 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 in the, just by hearing that title, you know, it's rubbish. But anyway, <laughs> the, the title said, The Better Sex, Anti-Aging, Better Sleep Hormone. That was how melatonin arrived on the scene. And melatonin is a, is a brain chemical, is a hormone, and it is secreted by the brain at night. Now, people think that melatonin puts you to sleep. It doesn't. Melatonin is a time signal. It tells the brain and body that it's time to go to sleep and then those various bits of the brain and body do what they need to do in order to go to sleep so when it goes dark you lose that blue light uh, and blue light is the thing that tells your brain to be awake but it's also the absence of blue light says it's night time and so about two hours after it's gone dark your brain will have a big spike of melatonin and that will then go around the body and brain and about two hours later you'll feel sleepy and want to go to sleep so melatonin is not a hypnotic it's not a sleeping tablet it doesn't put you to sleep and it doesn't keep you asleep um, and what it is is a chronobiotic it can change the timing of your sleep because it affects when that melatonin happens, that peak. Um, and so it was initially uh, used in jet lag. Um, studies were done uh, in, in the 80s and 90s in jet lag, and it showed to have some benefit, but only about two hours. So if you were to fly from Dubai to New York, Let's say you'd only get a two hour benefit okay. of, mm -hmm. of that, which I, I suppose puts you around about Spain, which is closer to America, but it's not America. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it has a mild effect on that, but it doesn't have an effect on sleep. But the, the issue is in America, it is not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. In America, melatonin is a food additive. 
So there is no control. And that big bag of melatonin capsules that you got sent, you've no clue what was in that. No. Nothing. Because there's no control on the ingredients or how much melatonin, whether there is even any melatonin in it. In the UK, melatonin is a controlled drug because what happened is the UK medical authority said, if melatonin is a better sleep, better sex, anti-aging pill, that's a medicine. So prove it. And of course, because it's a naturally occurring substance, nobody's going to invest a hundred million you know, dollars to prove in clinical trials that it works. Mm. But no, it's absolute hype um to you know, to suggest that melatonin it just you, you know it's it, it's just as i say it's good marketing and it is it's good uh you know when i was when i was about 18 i dabbled with um having a smoke of a bit of marijuana and um i don't know how many times i smoked it maybe four or five times i smoked it but it was a guaranteed way to send me to sleep no matter what time of day is there any is there any links between this and the and the chemicals involved in marijuana? <laughs> well, of course, now you can buy uh, CBD and CBN oils, uh, which are meant to help you with sleep. Oh, really? Yeah. What What is interesting uh, is that for every paper you can show me that says there is a benefit, I can show you another paper that says there is absolutely no benefit uh, to this. <laughs> What probably is the mechanism of action is dealing with anxiety and dealing with pain. We know cannabis is effective against pain, it's effective against anxiety. And so I don't believe it helps you sleep directly. I believe it puts you in a very, very nice place. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so, So cannabis is for you the same as sitting in on the couches to your parents (laughs) it's just you in a nice place so i think i say the 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 jury is out on cbd and cbdn oil you can't of course um sell delta thc which is the bit that gives you the fun bit of cannabis um (laughs) that's not legal yet. Uh, but yeah it probably again you're you're in a situation if you're smoking something like that you're in a situation where you are you know relaxed because if you weren't well you know if you were anxious that the police were going to kick down your door you you probably wouldn't do it so by definition you're already relaxed you smoke a bit it puts you to relax and you think yeah and you know say life seems or the grim drudgery of life seems simple. <laughs> Talk to me about different parts of the world, because it, it, oh, is there any correlation with certain nations, nationalities, um, religious backgrounds, um, uh, weather conditions, where certain countries are better overall at mastering um, the business of sleep than others? Well, I mean, we, we, we all have the post-lunch dip. Um, you know, people talk about the post-lunch dip. The post-lunch dip does not need food. The post-lunch dip is an evolutionary hangover um, because, as Noel Coward said, mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. At the height of the midday sun in Africa, on the plains of Africa where we evolved, it is impossible for us to do anything useful. We can't work. We can't hunt because it would just be, you know, we'd need so much water to, you know, it it would just be too much. So the idea was we didn't hunt. We hid under a tree or in a cave where it was cool. And you then, again, talking about me being safe and secure and having nothing to do, you slept. Now, of course, in some countries, this is the siesta. Um, and so the you know, closer to the equator you have the siesta. You go to somewhere like you know Asia, Thailand. They have the the the, the sort of the platform with a, a thatched roof, which is just a you know just a living space, but it's also a sleeping space in that heat of the sun. So so that as I say has translated into the siesta. We know that countries 
where they have a siesta shouldn't give it up. In Greece, they did a study where middle-aged civil servants, male civil servants, gave up the siesta. And in the next year, the rate of heart attack had increased by 26%. So there's an argument in Spain that Spain needs to modernize and get rid of the siesta. And that would be the worst thing to do. And we talked about genetic links in Ecuador. They have a very, very homogeneous population. There's very there's been very little interbreeding in the uh, you know, between other um, nations with Ecuador. And they have found a, gen a gene for the siesta. You are genetically predisposed to the siesta. So that's the, one of the biggest differences. The, um, the, the hot or hotter countries have that period during the day where it's too blooming hot to do anything. And therefore, they have that sleep. Now, of course, if you sleep for two hours in the day, you're going to need less sleep at night. So this is why when you go to somewhere like Spain, you can't get a meal before about nine o'clock at night um, because they're going to go to bed at midnight rather than at 10 o'clock because they've had that nap. The other thing is, is, about, the, is about comfort. Um, it, you know, you go to somewhere like Japan and they their view of a, what a comfortable bed is is very, very different from the sort of Anglo-Saxon, you know, mattress, which is half a metre deep full of dead sheep and things like that. You go to Japan and you, you, you've got a food. Even in, you know, cities like Tokyo, they're still sleeping on something that is, is, is a very, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a minimal should we say and uh, my partner's polish and and when i moved uh, my stuff over to poland i said i'm bringing my bed and she said why i said because i love my bed it cost a fortune and it's very very comfortable she said i can sleep anywhere <laughs> because in poland in communist times they had something called a veselka which is essentially a, 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 a settee that converts into a bed but the padding is only about three millimeters thick so she's been brought up with that. So she, her idea of me saying it's luxury, it's comfort, she went, what? <laughs> I don't need it. She now says it's wonderful. But it's, yeah. so, we, we, you know, we have, you know, we all sleep, but there are, you know, we, in primitive, we, I mean, we call it arrogantly, we call them in primitive nations but you know nations without or, or, or communities without electricity still sleep in the way that we did you know by the sun so in winter in in the you know in the north in england like we are now you know it's it's uh four o'clock it's getting a bit dark it'll be dark by five so like you know the outside world is telling me it's time to go to bed we would sleep more in you know, closer to the equator, your day lengths don't move as much. Uh, you know, they, they're pretty fixed. And so to have a fixed sleep wake pattern is a lot easier. Uh, but in, you know, say in the UK, sometimes it's dark at five o'clock, sometimes it's dark at half past nine. That's a four and a half hour change across the year. And yet we work nine till five. And so, so the differences between nations are being smoothed out, like I said, with Spain. They're, they're saying, oh, you know, in order to compete with Germany and Britain and France, we have to give up the siesta. And I, I regularly appear in the Spanish media saying, don't, just don't keep it. It's a good thing. You know, stop trying to be you know, English, where we have, it rains all the time. You have sun, you have warmth, enjoy it. <laughs> you know, stop trying to be something you're not. And, and I think that's the problem. We now all have the same things that disturb our state. We all have 24 hour TV. We all have the internet. We all have all of these things. And so we're all sort of becoming this, amorphous blob of sleepers and we will have you know we will have those same problems what's the correlation between sleep and disease 
uh, sleep, uh, and I, I mentioned earlier uh, this N3 sleep, this really deep sleep that makes up 25% of the night. This sleep is about something called homeostasis, which is just a fancy word for balance. So sleep keeps your body and your brain running optimally. So one of the things that happens during the night is that you um, produce T cells. T cells are the killer cells. They're the ones that roam around the body attacking invaders, so illnesses. And you also produce cytokines. Now, cytokines are sort of the battlefield commanders. They tell the T cells where to go. They say, right, you've got an infection, charge off down to the left foot and fight the infection. And that happens during your deep sleep. So we know that if you have one poor night's sleep, the next day you're four times more likely to catch the common cold. You're also more likely to catch hepatitis B and hepatitis C. We also know that if you have a vaccine when you have poor sleep, you can significantly reduce the efficacy of your vaccine. Now, we haven't yet got data on COVID, but the same rules apply. So it is very, very true that if you start feeling under the weather, it is far better to go to bed for the day and sleep as much as you can than it is to, you know, that I'll struggle through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, shall, I shall manly struggle. And you know, if you've got a domestic cat and the cat gets ill, you can spend all day chasing it around to take it to the vet. But what it wants to do is just go hide under a bush for three days, sleep, and then it comes back magically healed. Sleep is you know, nature's medicine. It allows your body, because when you're, when you're awake, your body is doing all the things it needs to do to be awake. And it's quite a complex thing being awake. But when you're asleep, the body hasn't, isn't doing anything, so it can do the things it needs, like fighting an infection or repairing after exercise, um, you know, your muscle repair and all that is done during the night. So, as I say, sleep is what keeps the body going, what keeps the brain going. Um, and as I say, poor sleep has been linked to increased risk of diabetes, obesity, depression, anxiety, heart disease, cancer. There's no good thing about a poor night's sleep. And, and this is what I'm saying. People spend a lot of money on gym membership, on vitamin supplements, on this or that. Uh, and yet a good night's sleep is free. You have to do it, whether you like it or not. It's a biological imperative. You can't avoid it. So why not do it well and do it enjoyably? Mm. Uh, you, you know, that's, that's the bit I don't get. Mm. Sleep is one of the best pleasures. When you wake up after a good night's sleep, there is no feeling like that. <laughs> no, you're right. It's um, interesting you say that because it, let, let me understand then uh, if somebody is, is put into an induced coma or is unconscious, is that in a, in a similar, I know it's not exact, but a similar kind of way, putting, your, putting that body into the place where it can start to try and heal itself? Is that exactly what's happening? That's, that, that's exactly why you use an induced coma because what you a medically induced coma because exactly that the body needs to repair itself the brain needs to repair itself all the time you're do you know what it's like when you you lose your car keys and you run around the house going oh my god oh my god where's my car keys where are my car keys the minute you stop thinking and panicking bang Oh, that's where I left it. Mm -hmm. But because you're running around, you're anxious, you can't think clearly, you, you can't process it. So if you've got a problem, if you think, oh, I wonder who sung that song 40 years ago, think about it just before you go to sleep and you'll have the answer in the morning. Because, again, if you go to a library, you take the time to walk around, to find the correct book, to find the answer. 
And that's what you, you're giving your brain that opportunity mm -hmm. to quietly find. But the more you go, oh, it's, um, it's uh, oh, I, I know, I know, I know. And your brain's going, yeah, you might know it, but I need to find it. Stop panicking and I will find it. And that, that you know, those are simple everyday examples of what is happening when you're sleeping or in a medically induced coma. Your body can just get on with what it needs to do. I mean, it's like, it's like trying to service a car whilst you're still driving the car it's like having the mechanic hanging over the boot trying to fix it and you're still driving it wouldn't work you have you know if you're servicing the car you have to stop the car we're a billion times more uh complex than any car so we do need that time to repair and recuperate. You, you, you mentioned just a minute ago about the correlation between poor sleep and chronic diseases so then then that then leads me to think about poor sleep, chronic diseases, life expectancy of people that have poor sleep must be considerably less on average. Is that there, right? There is, there is evidence for that, yes. Um, now, you could argue, I mean, again, um, you know, you've got socio socioeconomic factors in there. So people who have poor sleep, not short sleepers, I mean, you're a short sleeper, mm -hmm. but people who have poor sleep, there is a, gen there is a, there is socioeconomic factors there. So if you look at the data from America, most of this data is from America, the risk is in Afro-Caribbean people who are more likely to be poor, to have poor housing, to have poor diet, poor sleep is part of that but as i said earlier there's no good thing about bad sleep so you you know if you get a good night's sleep each and every night you will live better you will feel better than if you don't now getting a good you can you can do every healthy thing on earth but you can still get knocked down by a number 19 bus. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so the idea about sleep, good sleep, is not about living longer. It's about living better. Every day, if you get a good night's sleep, it will be better. So, you know, and, and I say people spend, you know, they get to Friday and they go, oh, you know, I have a glass of wine or I, I need to go to the spa, or oh, I need a holiday. And yet each night you have an eight-hour holiday that doesn't cost anything, makes you feel great. And you think, well, why don't you do it? What, what, what's stopping you from doing it? I, this is what I don't understand. Last couple of questions before we finish. Um, there, there are people out there that kind of like work hard all week. They, they maybe don't sleep as much as they could, and then the weekend comes, and then on the weekend – this is this is people that don't have kids, obviously. But the weekend comes and they go to bed and they wake up and they've slept an extra two or three hours on Friday night and Saturday night. Is that is that a sign to suggest to those people that you actually need more sleep during the week? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the thing with sleep is about is about consistency. The biggest change that anybody can make to their sleep is waking up at the same time each day. Because your brain and body starts waking up about 90 minutes before you wake up. So if you tell your brain and body, I'm going to wake up at seven, the brain and body can go, right, I will make sure that when seven o'clock arrives, you are ready to start the day. So fixing your wake up time seven days a week, 365 days a year is the biggest, most effective change you can make. Routine. Uh, you get into the habit. Now, if you work hard in the week and you sleep in at the weekend, people think, well, I'm making up the lost sleep. Yeah, You're yeah, not. Yeah. You put your system into a stress and your body is trying to get back to normality. You're not building back. You actually, you, you've created a deficiency. And the logic behind that is a bit like saying, if I eat McDonald's all week, but at the weekend, I just eat lettuce. Is that a healthy diet? 
<laughs> and you'd go, no, of course it's not. That's that's stupid. But with sleep, we have that mentality. And the problem is, what happens in the week? You have your fixed wake up time because of work. At the weekend, you you know Friday night, Saturday night, you go to bed a bit later, you sleep in. Your body goes and your brain goes. We're on holiday. This is great. <laughs> And then the alarm goes off on Monday morning and your body goes, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought we were on holiday, you know. And so actually the Monday morning feeling that we all have is caused by us not having that regularity at the weekend. So actually sleeping in at the weekend makes your sleep in the week worse and you then into that vicious cycle fascinating fascinating stuff for the listeners and and the viewers of this podcast right now if they wanted to learn more about your work how would they find out about you how would they uh, uh, i mean you've written books and stuff like that so what, what would what would be a good place for them to start okay my my website is the sleep com. so all is one word the sleep com. Uh, everything about me is on there um, and you know there's facts and tips and uh, the you know the my book which is called how to sleep well uh, which is basically a, a written version of what we've just said so it's got jokes it's, it, it, it's factual it's designed to cut through the myths and the rubbish that is talked about uh, about sleep and uh, designed to help you get a better night's sleep so I say sleepconsulty.com is where I am and so for those people that are interested, just give me a statistic. What percentage of people do you believe, on average, get a poor night's sleep? I think about 30 to 50 percent at any one time. Because that's massive. It is, because, as I say, people aren't doing it. You know, people, people spend less on their bed than they spend on their television. You know, you're going to spend 220,000 hours of your life in bed. You're going to spend more time in your bed than anywhere else in your life, any other position. And you think that's worth a hundred pounds <laughs> or, you know, 400 pounds from Ikea. Is that all it's worth when you spend, you know, a couple of thousand on your, your 4K or 8K TV? It, it, that's, we don't, you know, sleep in the past was a pleasure it was a joy. It was, you know, the uh, what the the uh, the, the labour the the, the the balm for the labouring man, sweet nourishment, as Shakespeare said. It was a good thing. Now it's a waste of time because you want to watch funny cat videos, and talk to your imaginary friends on Facebook. <laughs> um, we're not improving ourselves. If people were saying, "Oh, I'm not sleeping because I'm, you know, curing cancer," fine. I've no problem with that. But if you're just watching cat videos, then go to sleep. <laughs> Get a grip. Go to sleep. Brilliant. And on that note, Dr. Neil Stanley, thank you so much for coming to join us on the show. What a world of wisdom tonight. I've learned so much. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure, Spencer. Thanks for having me. Well, hopefully you've enjoyed this episode. It's fascinating talking to an expert of sleep. It's such an underrated subject, isn't it? You know, we think about it, okay? We sometimes argue about it. We debate it. We get frustrated with our partners, you know? Do they sleep enough? Do they sleep too much? Are they always in bed? Does it seem? But sleep and deep sleep helps us heal, and that's an important thing to consider. If you've enjoyed this episode, you can click over there. And you can get more episodes of the podcast. If you click over there, you can subscribe. And I tell you what, it means the world to me when you subscribe. You get the benefit of all of the content we produce. And I get the benefit of being able to engage with you more consistently and more intimately. So please do me a favor and click over there and subscribe to the channel. Thanks very much. And I will see you on the next episode. So it's always important to mention people that you partner with and partners for the podcast are Najahi events and Najahi tribe. Now, Najahi sounds like an unusual word and it is, but it's Arabic for my success. And Najahi have brought some of the world leading 
public speakers, motivational speakers, inspirational leaders across to Dubai over the course of the years, and Abu Dhabi, mind you. And Najahi brought, I don't know, people like Tony Robbins, ever heard of him? Okay, Nick Vujicic, no arms, no legs, no worries. Lisa Nichols, Prince EA, Jay Shetty, uh, Alicia Keys, and people like this. And they bring them in and they run events. And from those events, we go and we learn from these incredible people. On top of that, they launched the Najahi tribe recently, where they have a collective of the world's greatest trainers that literally you can join, become a member of, take advantage of a training from all of these different people, like real experts in their field. I've got a sneaky suspicion I might be one of them as well. But anyway, (laughs) hopefully you will go and check them out for me because you enjoy these episodes of the podcast. And remember, it's always team effort and I can't do it without the support of these people. So go check out Najahi Events, N-A-J-A-H-I events.com. I'll see you soon.